Yeah. Can I take a bathroom break? Yes. Yeah, I'm just like sitting here drinking all this water. <laughs> Uh, I grew up out, like an hour outside of Toronto in Whitby, Ontario, um, and I moved to Toronto in 2005, I think, to go to uh, OCAD here, and I've been living here ever since. Uh, it was really good. Um, I mean, like, I think a lot of people have issues with art school, but I think I had a pretty good experience. Um, just like. I didn't really know much. I felt like when I when I started art school, I was like pretty uh, sheltered in terms of like knowing anything about art or comics or illustration. So it was like pretty eye-opening for that reason. And I just I met a lot of really good people. Like I met Jeanette Lapalm and Chris Kuzma and like Jess G. Jill and uh, just like lots of people who have helped out my career and just inspired me. No one I went to high school with was like a creative person. Like I was in a band with some dudes in high school, but uh, no one was really interested in like visual art at all. <laughs> yeah, it was a drag. I went to OCAD with the intention of just drawing comics and I chose the illustration program um, because it seemed like, like the preview on the website seemed like what I wanted to do. Um, just like based on like the picture and the description of the program or it seemed like the thing I should take if I wanted to pursue drawing comics uh, and then like I didn't really know what illustration was until I was in the program and uh, that was like pretty interesting to find out and it's become like uh, become my career and I, of course I do comics as well. I enjoy drawing a lot, I enjoyed, enjoyed like cartoons on TV, like I enjoyed the storytelling a lot, and like daydreaming, <laughs> I just like naturally gravitated towards it. Uh, my grandma used to send me like a, my, the comic that I read the most as a kid was The Beano, it was like a comic from England, my grandma used to send it to me from, she lived in Northern Ireland where like all my fam family's from, and she would send it to me every week. Um, with like my, she would send like the Irish newspaper over to my parents so they could read it and then she would send my sister like a teen magazine and she would send me the Beano and she sent it every week from like 1992 to like maybe like the year 2000 or something, I don't know, it was like a really long time. So I had like stacks and stacks of them in my parents' house. There were some really good comics in there, uh, looking back on it, like for a while I was like, oh that's just like juvenile stuff that I shouldn't think about, but then like looking at them, it's like, these are really funny. And like some, some of them are like stinkers, but there's like a lot in it that's really well drawn. No, that's like, yeah, I got into that because of school, I think. And just like being, going to the Big Island and just like looking for weird stuff and just knowing people. Uh, it was exciting. Um, like around, I think in like 2007, it was like the first time we tabled at the Toronto Comic Arts Festival. And that was like maybe we were in second or third year at OCAD, and Jeanette and I tabled at that um, as like the OCAD student table, and it was like really exciting. Like uh, Picture Box and like Buenaventura Press were like in like the height of their publishing career, and there was like lots of really interesting stuff at the time. That was like a, a project that Chris, I think Chris Guzma and I like just like talked about it a lot. Like Chris and I used to just hang out a lot and just like talk about the state of comics and illustration and just like blabbing and we, I don't know, we wanted to make something that was like Kramer's Ergot or something like that but just like had artwork in it or had just like the work of Canadian people because we felt like there was a lot of people. There was a couple of people in our program like namely like Jeanette and like Andre Georgescu and like a few other people in our program who were making really cool stuff and we just wanted to do something like that. So that our, the first issue was like, I think in 2007 was the first issue, or 2008 maybe, and we got a small grant from the school to do it, they gave us 200 bucks. And it was only because like our friend was on like the, 
the granting committee and <laughs> gave us the money. So they gave us like 200 bucks to put this zine together. Um, and we made 200 copies of it, the first one. And then it kind of just like snowballed from there. The, the first two, the first one just had like myself, Chris, and Jeanette in it. The second one had like nine, maybe nine people and was like a newsprint um, edition that we, we got printed like somewhere in North Toronto. Um, and that was like pretty crazy, like it was like 2,000 books. It was like such a big step, but it was like the price was like pretty reasonable. So we just went for it. Um, but then after that one, we hooked, that was like this, the second book we did with Koyama Press was the third volume of Wabi Zonk. And that was like kind of a different format. Um, that one was only like every contributor did four pages of content. Um, and it was different. It was like all different people pretty much than we, we had previously had. I think, yeah, mostly. And then the fourth one like was along the same lines. That was all new people. And that was like a Koyama Press book as well. Um, but that was the last one we did. And that one was like in 2000, 2000. 11 or 2012, I think. Um, and we haven't thought about it much since then. <laughs> in 2009, when we launched, like, we had, like, we graduated from OCAD. We did, like, the, all of this stuff at once. Like, we graduated from OCAD and we had, like, our grad show. We had an art show and book launch for Why We Zong 2. And then we also had, like, we curated the small press room at TCAF that year, and this was all in like a week's time. So like there was our grad show, our art show, and setting us up. So it was like a crazy week for us. And uh, Annie came to the art show and launch, and I like I didn't know her. And I was like, who is this lady? And she bought like a stack of the comics and was just like handing them out to people, like um, which is pretty crazy. And then I think she might have bought a piece of art from Jeanette or something. Uh, and she was just starting the press at the time. She was, I think, she was just looking for people who were active, and, like interested, and like self-motivated in the field. And then she just expressed interest in working with us. And the first little volume we did with her was called Poe Buddies Nerfect, and it was like a small collection of artwork from Jeanette, Chris, and I. Uh, it was, just, it was like a number of things. It was just a, a desire to do a lot. Like during our, like we had, like our thesis projects, like the three of us like had made so many pieces. Like we were just really, we were really enthusiastic. Uh, we had all just like created a lot of work. We're doing a lot of work like inside and outside school. And we just had like, we had like a pile of work and uh, we were also compiling the work for Why We Zong 2, so we wanted to do a launch, and then there was like a really affordable space that like a friend of a friend was running, so we uh, we rented it out for a night. So like it was just a, an evening, like the artwork came down the next day, I think, but it was just like affordable at the time. <laughs> it's pretty easy. I think that, like the community aspect of it is great, like. I wouldn't have been able to get like a risograph if I hadn't been able to buy it with two other people. Um, like having the Rizo is like a huge, been a huge, huge like part of my career. Um, just like made publish like self publishing so affordable and so easy and convenient. Like it's amazing, uh, and just like knowing other people who know how to work the machines is amazing, uh, and just being like surrounded by other people who are working. All the time, like I think I feel like I almost exclusively hang out with cartoonists, and like all we talk about is like, oh, what are you working on? What are you working on? And there's like always this sort of uh, desire to like go home and start working on stuff again. Um, yeah, that's it's a really cool thing, and like having um, like working with Annie and like meeting Annie, like living here, uh, has been like a huge. It has had like a huge impact on my career as well. TCAP is amazing. Uh, the like the staff of the Beguiling and Chris Butcher and his team who set up the show are just really ambitious and like really dedicated to comics, and they've done uh, such a huge um, favor by allowing us to curate this small press area we've been doing it for like seven years now which is like amazing because it's a spot it's like 
part of the show and they could definitely like uh, make money from the table fees from like the space they're giving us and they choose every year to like let us um, curate the space and offer the tables free of charge to the exhibitors that we're inviting uh, and that's amazing uh, it's been like it's been great we're like a lot of people like maybe from the states who are making really great stuff or from elsewhere like outside of Toronto it's like wouldn't be financially uh, viable for them to like all, to travel have somewhere to stay and then like pay their table fees um, so, and then they would they, they probably wouldn't make any money at the show um, because of that so it's like it's been really great for that reason yeah it's really it's really exciting um, to see the show also grow like such a in such an insane way like from 2007 to now like uh, it's crazy like it's grown so grown so much and there's like so much diverse uh, materials now and like so many different people being involved in comics in different ways it's really interesting um, I knew Michael just like through the scene I guess like we were both just into the same things like noise music punk music and like art shows I used to like just see him around at launches for things um, but we started, like we knew each other through like working with Koyama Press as well and then we started hanging out more once we were playing in a band together. Uh, we were in a band with Zach Wharton and Crystal Tabahara for a while, um, which eventually like we, it was like a garage rock band and at a certain point Michael and I were like, we're not really into garage rock, why are we in this band? And, so we, we formed uh, our current band, Creep Highway, which is like a noise punk band. We did a book with Parish Publishing uh, a few years ago, and like how that happened was just like, I sent Michael a bunch of drawings and he composed them into an image and we've kind of worked that way um, for a while like just if there was a gig poster or something like if our band was playing a show or if we were doing a book launch I would just send him send Michael a pile of drawings and he would make the poster for it uh, yeah it's kind of a funny way of collaborating I have like absolutely no say in the final product it's just like here you go buddy take care of this Yeah, I think it's kind of like, it's just for fun. I don't, I don't think either of us think much about the band outside of when we're actually practicing. Uh, we just recorded a new thing like two weeks ago and we're waiting for the master tracks to come back. Um, yeah, we don't really think about it much. It's just sort of like, it's kind of cathartic. I really like playing the drums a lot. I wish I could do it more. Um, but we just go like, we don't even practice that much. We practice like maybe once a month and just go for two hours and like, Maybe Michael has made a song, and we'll just like turn it into a song. I'll like put some drums to it, but it's like pretty. It's a pretty casual band, but it's like also just like a lot of fun. It's like exciting to go and play a show. Like doing like the lead up to doing editorial stuff was like studying illustration at school and finding out what that was, and like realizing that there could be a career in drawing rather than just like only drawing comics there was like other money to be had um, and I've been I've managed to like turn that into like a, my career that's like my day job is doing that kind of stuff um, but it's just been like a lot of uh, I don't know it's been like funny and strange how that happened because uh, I never like saw myself doing that and like so for this for the most part like um, I don't often think of myself as an illustrator, but it's like something that I just do on the side. But it's like, it's a pretty different approach than what I do in my comic. My, my comics work, I feel like is really loose and it's like really um, like idiosyncratic and like maybe difficult for people to understand. And then when I'm doing illustration stuff, it's like I have to sort of like get out of the bubble and like refocus and be like, all right, now I have to make an image that like communicates an idea like in a really coherent way. Uh, I'd love to have the two like cross over more and I feel like my older illustration stuff was like way more 
it was harder for people to like place it in like com in a commercial zone. So I've kind of like rebranded myself a bit <laughs> last year. Uh, I do like a lot of digital stuff now, and I think it's like easier for people to stomach. It's going it's going pretty well. Um, yeah, but it's def it's definitely different, uh, and it definitely takes like I definitely have to like flip a switch when a job comes in, and I'm like, all right, I have to stop working on this like personal work and then get into this like mindset of like reading reading an article and like pinpointing like visual cues in it and like visual information that I can turn into a piece of artwork. Recently like Lucky Peach has been fun. I did a piece for them like a couple months ago that was like a really short deadline and they were just like do whatever you want and like that's always great. I love just like when art directors are pretty chill with that and I think most people that hire me know that I'm pretty idiosyncratic even in my illustration work so um, they mostly just give me like free reign to do whatever I want. Yeah that, that was a good one. Um, I just did an illustration for like about Tamagotchis which is kind of funny that was like a pretty cool thing to do and it was like the same thing I was just like I'll just do whatever I want. I don't think so. Uh, like I don't like I do have like a small income from producing zines and selling zines, but I don't know if it's like a really sustainable method. Because it's like if you're doing all of the self-publishing yourself, like you can have your work like printed by somebody. Like you can go to Kinkos and get them to make it, or you can go to Jez G to color code or something and get them all made. Um, and that can be pretty expensive. And then you can only sell your zine for like. A certain amount of money at a certain point people are gonna be like no I'm not paying like $15 for this like piece of paper um, yeah like so I I think it, like, the most sustainable ways to do everything yourself and like that's what I'm, I'm doing but it takes a lot of time like the hours that you put in like folding and cutting and stapling like it's a lot of labor and then like to make 200 copies of a book it might take like a couple of days uh, and then you make like five dollars per copy like I mean like you're still making some money after your material costs but um, I'm not sure if it's like it's um, a really great way to make money but it's like certainly very fun and I like having I like making objects I like the satisfaction of like having a big stack of like this thing that I made like just paper ephemera that I can either like I'm getting a little more like apathetic about making money for that kind of stuff and like I feel cool about just like handing out zines to people and just giving it away um, or selling it for less money just because it like I don't know and like also just using cheaper materials like the last two issues like for the first four issues of my comics my most recent comic series new comics I was trying to make like a really like polished volume each time um, and that was fun and everything but then once I got to the fifth one, I was like, I just want to make something like dirty and like just like a really rough aesthetic that is like really imperfect that I can sort of just like give to people and like throw away and like sell for a couple of dollars. So I switched to just like I only print on well, I've only been printing a newsprint lately. I can I have like the art supply store nearby has like stacks of 500 sheets of newsprint for like ten dollars and it goes through the risograph pretty well. And it makes like really funny looking scenes that like fade, start the paper starts yellowing in like two months, and they just sort of like, or I don't know, and, like this lot the the Rizzo actually it doesn't actually take the newsprint too well sometimes like some of the pages are crooked or like have like a wrinkle in them or something, and I think it just like adds to the scene a lot, makes it funny, like semi destroyed object when you're are <laughs> when you're buying it. Yeah, it was like a way to monetize like the traction that I was picking up on the internet, I guess. Like having an object that someone can order through the mail was a cool thing. I didn't do too much, like, I mean, like, I did a couple of small zine fairs um, in Toronto, but I think most of my, like, most of my sales are through the internet through, for zines. Like, it's certainly, like, a great way. I guess, yeah, it's a pretty good way to, like, get your work out there, just, like, have to have an object. Um, to be able to mail to people is pretty cool. <laughs> All my
my comics were just like drawing based. They were about like doing crazy drawings and like that was it for like most of the bulk of my early career. It's like my juvenile period where everything was just about like the way things looked. Like so like, I feel like all of my comics like in Black Mass, my first book, were all just like sort of just about like the visual impact of the whole thing. Not really about writing at all. Um, and Distance Mover I think started the same way. It was just sort of like about creating like a visual thing. I never really thought too much about writing and like storytelling much to be honest until like um, Michael and Mickey Zakili and I were doing this series that there was like um, there, we call them blank comics and there's like every issue has just like a um, like a theme so like there's a cop comic, basketball comic, Pixar's Cars comic, Christmas comic, um, and so on and uh, we did a bunch of them and like the first one I did was like kind of shitty and then like as I kept going I was like just getting into these like really stupid topics and then like building little stories about them and I felt like I don't know I feel I think that really helped my writing out like if you look at those like there's probably like quite a progression of like my writing in those I've been thinking a lot more about writing lately I've been like reading a lot more books too rather than just comics um, yeah like I've been working on stuff that's like almost like the images like are secondary now or it's like maybe there's more of a balance between the writing and the uh, and the images uh, yeah I think it's good I think it's helping me become more accessible to more people <laughs> yeah definitely yeah I'm like terrified about that um, my first two books like my first book was self-published so it wasn't really like a long I mean there wasn't really much of a risk there. I mean, there was a risk personally, but I wasn't accountable to anyone but myself. Um, but with my set, like with Distance Mover, yeah, I worry all the time about that book. And like, I always, I don't know, like before it was published, I was like, why, why am I even doing this? Like, this is stupid. No one is going to want to read this thing. Um, but it, I don't know, the book worked out. Luckily, I think it's like a pretty cool book. Um, yeah, but like with what I'm working on now, it's like I feel like I want to have like more. I want, yeah, I, I do want to be more accessible. My the board, the book I'm working on now is like a little more easier to stomach. It has like has panels and has like more writing and like less just like chaos and like weird like time travel and science fiction. That's hard to get a grasp on, but it's like it's still like it's still strange and it's still like. Um, I'm not holding anyone's hand with it. It's still gonna be like a book you're gonna have to th like put yourself in to get the full experience, um, which is cool. But I think it'll be like just easier for people to get into. In the last year, I read like every Blake Butler book. Um, he's like an author from Atlanta. Uh, his writing is. It's pretty uh, intense. It's like, um, and I, I sometimes I feel like his writing is like the way I thought about comics. Is like I want to make comics that can only exist as comics, and I feel like his writing is like can only. I mean, it's probably the true for a lot of writing that I, I, I'm. I'm not like the most literary person, but like I feel like his writing could only exist as like a, a book. There's like no way to like visualize it. It can't exist in any other medium, and I think that's kind of cool. That was really exciting for me. Um, other artists, I don't know, like, I haven't been looking at too much artwork lately. I, like, constantly think about, like, Brian Chippendale's work. It's always in the back of my mind, like, Matt Brinkman. That, that scene I've been, like, kind of revisiting a lot lately, just because they're, like, um, I felt myself, like, tightening up a lot, and I, I kind of wanted to revisit, like, that kind of energy that inspired me when I was, like, first in school, like, the stuff in, like, the early Kramer's Ergot books been thinking a lot about that lately. <laughs> it's like, yeah, fully, I think, an ideology that I have took on. Like, I'm, I'm a commercial artist, I make commercial work, but it's like, um, 
I'm very um, stubborn. I really like having everything my own way, and I like doing everything myself. Um, so I'm like pretty involved in all the things that I I do. Like uh, I like to be in control of it, and I think that's kind of like a punk attitude. It's like making sure everything is like going your way. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's it. Yeah, it's just about like creating spaces for people to, and myself, to sell their work and get their, get your work out to people. Uh, yeah, like any opportunity I can, I can take to create that sort of environment. It's like, it's cool. Uh, I'm working on a book uh, right now for Quantum Press that's coming out in 2016 in the spring. It's called Don't Come In Here uh, and it's like a story. It's like a kind of like a haunted house story about a guy in like a, a, a like a supernatural apartment that where anything can kind of happen and does. Um, that Yeah, it's coming out next year. I'm supposed to be finishing that by the end of the month um, but I have like seven days left or something so I don't know if that's gonna happen we'll see um, after that I'm I need to do like another zine I want to do that um, I got a grant early in the year to do another book project like a book length project that I need to start working on and I'm hoping to have that finished by the end of the year as well um, and outside that I don't know I'm like kind of jonesing to make some like larger artworks again. I haven't like done any like fine art type work in a long time and I'm kind of like anxious to maybe start trying to do that again. I don't know, um, for recently I haven't been making that, like I haven't been making that distinction in any of my work. I, for a while, like when I was in school and just out of school, like I was making work that was like this is art and this is like the artwork that I make and then this is illustration and this is my comics but it's all kind of like it's kind of like come together a bit um, I don't make like I haven't made like physical pieces for a while like I had this like pretty distinctive approach with like handmade paper and like acrylic matte medium transfer that I was doing forever like it's like a technique that I worked out in school um, and like all of my work was like that but I just got really sick of it and like the, the commercial, um, it wasn't like really applicable to commercial art. It wasn't like, I, w I think it was hard for people to see it in like, in accompanying an article. And it looked nice in a gallery, but I don't think anyone was interested in buying them. Uh, so I had just like stacks of these things and I'm like, what am I gonna do with all of this junk? So I just stopped. It's like, forget it, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, and uh, another funny thing that happened was like my scanner broke and I had to buy a new scanner and I bought this new scanner and it doesn't scan color at all. Like I was working with like really fluorescent paints and stuff and this scanner just like doesn't, doesn't register with them. So I'm like, all right, I guess I'm not doing this anymore. And then I started working, coloring my stuff digitally after that, uh, which has like been going pretty well. Um, but uh, yeah, there's like, I haven't been doing any gallery work really. I had a small show um, last year at Weird Things Gallery with my friend Dan Rocca. And it was just like, uh, he does a lot of like black and white drawing, like ink on paper drawing. And I had a pile of that stuff just hanging around from like stuff I had made for zines, like just like one, weird one-off drawings for zines or just like weird one-off drawings that I never put in anything. And that, that, that show was like kind of that stuff. Um, I don't know, like Toronto's a weird, I don't know if there's like a really great market for like graphic weirdo graphic arts in Toronto, so it's kind of a tough sell. And I don't, I don't want to like, um, I just felt kind of like tired with the with that kind of scene and like going to art, art openings and like having this like so much attention thrown on me and then like trying to like get people to like drop hundreds of dollars on just like on my work. It just like wasn't really working for me at the time. Yeah, like the fi fine art stuff is like, uh, I don't even know how I'm, I'm gonna approach it. I'd love to 
do like really large work. I'd love to have like a space where I could go and just like make a huge mess and uh, not have to worry about it too much, but I keep this like studio pretty neat just because like can get kind of chaotic when I have like stacks of paper piling up and I like I would be such like a set up tear down thing if I like wanted to start doing like larger pieces in here. I think I'm probably gonna have, I, I have nowhere else to go, so <laughs> I'm probably gonna have to do that if I wanna do it. Yeah, I like to do that, I don't really have, and I and maybe I don't have the time right now either, cause I'm like pretty invested in doing comics work. Um, music stuff too, like I've been like doing solo, like black metal recordings myself for like f five or six years. Uh, I finally released a tape of just a collection of weird stuff that I had been recording over the years, just in in my st in the studio or in my old apartment or whatever. Just like I just record with guitar and like do overdubs with the drum machine. I'd love to like have a band going with some other people, but it's like just hasn't been really working. I just don't really have the time. Yeah, we'll see what happens in the future.